innovation and creativity in digital media. Oh. I guess innovation bears some kind of, I feel it has more of a, like I already specified externally recognized value, whereas creativity might be something more personal and it's on the way, but innovation is already a thing, kind of an outcome that has an, like a validation from outside. So um, creativity would be um, targeting more um, symbolic subjects, like uh, painting, art, sculpture, uh, but up to imagery uh, um, related to advertising, communication and so on. Innovation is more uh, related to, uh, uh, to uh, products and, uh, and, and, uh, and commodities and things that we use in our daily life. I would define it maybe as the ability to surprise yourself still without thinking or doing things in pre-made uh, or pre-thought ways that I could think comes close to the idea of creativity. I think some of my words are creative words, some of my words are innovative words. Um, the main difference, actually I didn't define the differences, but I heard the difference between innovation and creativity is uh, innovation uh, is more than just creative, it has a value. I get an idea or I'm following something and I go for it wherever it leads. And if it turns out to be something that somebody would say was innovative, uh, that's great. Uh, I think everybody would say it was uh, creative. Um, but how innovative it is would depend on your or the, the uh, seer's uh, background experience. If they'd never seen anything like that, uh, they might see it as more innovative. If they're kind of in the field and they've seen a lot of similar things, then they might not see it as innovative. Uh, but personally, I don't make a distinction in my own mind. When you talk about like innovation, I suppose um, particularly, you know, relevance to um, the media and technology, it has to be some sort of like um, um, expressions um, that um, closely related to a very um, innovative use of um, the medium. So in that sense, I, I guess, you know, um, for an oil painter, if um, he or she wants to do some very innovative work, they probably need to really think about how um, these, you know, oil colors and canvas can be applied and used in a very different way. Innovation to me is a process whereby um, organizations work to increase the value that they're, that they're manifesting in all of their stakeholder relationships. And creativity is, you know, at, at one level, creativity is the process of taking ideas to successful reality. And therefore, in, in that sense, it's almost it's synonymous with the concept of innovation. But to me, creativity, the way, the way I tend to use the word creativity is to refer to how good or bad the organization is at finding ideas, generating ideas, and ultimately what it does with those ideas in terms of developing them. But I do know that these days, innovation also seems to be a big buzzword that is connected with sort of an economic side of things. And I certainly don't like that version of the word because I think it gets very misused. Um, that kind of innovation, which I think is still a sign of intelligence and cleverness and, and you know, is a really good thing, but you know, figuring out how to make money by selling something, something that already exists by just calling it something else, that's economic innovation. You know, there's, there's so many different definitions of innovation and, and you can practically pick up 10 books on innovation and have 10 different definitions. And that's still the case. I mean, I, I tend to buy all these books on innovation and I still see that people uh, offer up different definitions. Maybe it has more to do with design, if you want to make the distinction between design and art also. It's like innovation, I feel, has more to do with the specific use, where it's 
it might be a specific technology that has a specific use or it might be a, a concept or a, another kind of output. For me, creativity and uh, innovation are two things that sound positive, but they are not always positive. When, when people started to talk about creativity, they were uh, referring to communication and communication to advertising and uh, all these things where people were uh, asked to, uh, to create surprises, to uh, produce unexpected uh, things. And uh, I'm not sure in art, the, the quality of the work is only about unexpected things. And creativity, which could become this frenzy uh, of uh, research of difference, may, be, uh, may become a real problem for the quality of the work and the quality of art. But creativity has not the necessity to be bound to innovation. Um, so you can be creative without being innovative. Uh, I think creativity could be um, new ideas. Uh, it could be a mixture of different ideas and then, and then it generates its own value. And then for innovation, I think, I think it, it is it will have a more designed purpose that uh, that creative um, artifact would you know, contribute to the human being in some way, for some purpose. My understanding is that creativity is concerned with making an aesthetic object, whereas innovation is more the delivery of that object. Um, so I have this aesthetic object, how do I get it uh, seen? How do I get it heard? How do I engage people with it? Words like, you know, just to be creative, actually um, you can, you know, um, remain in a very conventional uh, way of expressions. Um, for example, like um, you can be a, 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 a painter and you can do very creative works with, you know, canvas and oil colors. But it would be quite difficult for me to understand this as a very innovative work. And so innovative is often putting together existing pieces in slightly different ways, which certainly involves perhaps some creative thought. But so maybe it's a it's a spectrum. <laughs> and at one end of the spectrum, I'd say it's that's creativity. And another one, it's innovation. And what that spectrum is measuring is possibly some sort of originality in the sort of cosmic sense of no one has ever thought of this before. Oh, that's creative. Oh, other people have thought of things, but they haven't done it exactly this way in this situation. Oh, well, that's innovation. And obviously the two aren't that far apart and it's a matter of degrees. I enjoy the concept of an idea tornado rather than a funnel. You've, you've all, you've, you know, you're aware of the idea of funnel where you, typically it's on its side and you say, you know, you shove a lot of ideas in and then you focus and narrow it down and then ultimately you successfully commercialize. Well, I, I prefer to think of it as a tornado. And of course you want to build the tornado as wide as possible at the top because the only bad idea is the one that gets away, right? The one that doesn't get expressed because uh, someone's afraid of being fired by pointing out the, the so-called dumb idea. Um, so you want to build the funnel as wide as you can. But then, of course, the, the, really, uh, the art, I think, and the science of creativity shows that what you really need to do is create a lot of swirl and mix uh, within this tornado. You, 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 you know, you, you've got to create a lot of diversity. Um, most organizations uh, fail to look outside for ideas, so they they uh, just, you know, they, they have the mistaken belief that, that ideas and creativity is going to happen within the R&D department or within the academic institution. And in my view, it doesn't, doesn't work that way. The great, the great ideas uh, will come when the academic or the researcher or the, or the developer uh, looks at something in a, in a new way. So I don't say we shouldn't research uh, a certain kind of novelty in our practice, 
but uh, let's say relevant novelty that can be related to the time, uh, related to the history, uh, related to our specific concerns we address in our work. On a philosophical level, on a level of, of discussing that outside or outside my workplace or outside my, uh, my practice, uh, I would distinguish between innovation and creativity. I think they are, they are completely different things, to be honest. Uh, I think uh, I, when I create or have an idea, I didn't really think of, it, of the application. For example, now I'm working on some serious engineering project, but uh, I, had, I just had the creative idea. I didn't think of what this you know, innovation or this uh, new uh, algorithm or new um, invention that I'm putting forward to have, will have a real life uh, situation to apply to it. I guess innovations also um, in a very narrow sense, it has to be something, um, um, you know, expressed it with some sort of like, um, you know, new context or new um, paradigms. But I would say in some ways, creativity is perhaps the singular characteristic that makes people human. Yeah, you, know, you can talk about empathy and other things, and I'm not sure I know enough about animals to know the distinctions. And I do know that animals are creative in certain ways. But I would say that, for example, apes and chimpanzees definitely show absolutely signs of innovation. You know, they make tools, they discovered how to use them. So maybe that's creativity, maybe that isn't. I, I'm, I'm happy to actually say they're kind of the same thing. I define innovation as the creation of new net value. And I hasten to then define the term value because otherwise the definition is incomplete, right? So I define value not just as money, although of course commercial enterprises often want to measure the success or failure of their efforts to innovate in terms of bottom line results and, and return on investment. But I, I, I guess because I'm a psychologist, I have a broader concept of value. Value to me is a psychological phenomenon. And even the value of money isn't, isn't absolute. The, the value of money, of course, fluctuates based on the psychology around it, right? It base, it's uh, how much we value a US dollar or a, a British pound or, or whatever is based on various factors, perception, psychological factors. Um, the value we may individually place on money is, is based on how we feel about what we feel we can do with that money, right? Or whether it, it provides our family's security or whether we think we're gonna have a fabulous holiday or put a smile on our child's face or whatever, right? So it's a psychological phenomenon. To me, I see that at least the way things are currently used, there is a little bit of difference between creativity and innovation. And I suppose, you know, there are people who creatively figure out how to separate other people from their money. <laughs> and we call it innovation. I've been working for the last uh, 30 years uh, with uh, digital media when they were very often just, uh, just born. Uh, let's say newborn media, and uh, and very often I had to contribute to uh, the creation of the tools to to make it uh, to make uh, their use possible for arti artistic purpose. So I primarily study players, computer game players, uh, as well as design computer games for serious uses. By serious uses here, I mean. Uh, games for education, for raising awareness, for rehabilitation, and for people with special needs. So a lot of the research I do has actually to do with materials um, being then augmenting or augmenting um, 3D prints or digital data and then rescanning. So there's a continuous uh, interchange between, on the one hand side, material properties, on the other hand side, digital properties. I'm a media artist. I'm also a uh, researcher in media technologies. Um, I'm working on several projects. Uh, mainly they are 
um, engineering and computer science uh, driven project, but uh, I'm interested in creating systems uh, to facilitate creativity. So on the research side, I do um, work in 3D audio. Uh, specifically um, in 3D audio, speakers overhead, um, how do you diffuse sound, how do you record sound for the future cinemas, uh, which should have 16 discrete channels. So that's very academic, published papers, uh, have a patent application. Uh, most of my work is actually on the creative side. I create um, um, artworks that involve like, different kinds of um, you know, uh, materials and techniques and technologies um, from um, very conventional photography to um, digital video and also um, mechanical devices that would um, allow the uh, media presentation um, to be viewed in creative ways. So I'm a computer scientist and, and uh, I've worked uh, in both more somewhat fundamental research and also applied research in terms of uh, developing applications that use other, let's say breakthroughs or just you know new, new techniques. Uh, that goes back uh, to 1968 when I worked at Lawrence Livermore Lab as a, uh, well, originally it was called mathematical programmer, but the artistic creativity side, the kind of work uh, really began in the late 70s and early 80s when I was a faculty member at the University of Waterloo. We, uh, I and a colleague and later some of the colleagues joined, uh, formed the computer graphics laboratory. And we work with a lot with other people on campus. And I think that's kind of a theme throughout my career. I've often worked with people in other disciplines who've been users of the tools that I was developing. Now, the whole point of my book was to try and make sense of my personal experience and also what I had observed in, in others, in, in successful and unsuccessful organizations, in terms of their ability to innovate or their failure to innovate. And uh, I was drawing on my experience as, as a co-founder of the MIT Innovation Lab and the fact that in that environment, I got to work with some of the really great innovation organizations like 3M. Uh, and we, and to apply what I was learning from that sharing of secret sauces and recipes for innovation, to apply that in my own uh, efforts to, to lead and drive innovation. Time um, is not, for me, is not counted as such isolated elements. That means um, if I have 10 minutes, um, it doesn't mean I have 10 minutes because usually when you start working, you have like, you need some time to start up. Okay. So in this case, if, you know, your, your, your available time have been really chopped up to you know, short sessions, and that actually is not a good idea. Organizations often don't, um, they don't create enough uh, time or focus for innovation. So they, um, you know, they think innovation will just happen because you know, if you say make somebody the innovation director and, and stick 10 people in the innovation department, um, then innovation is gonna happen. Well. Not really, right? Innovation's only going to happen if they're spending quality time trying trying to innovate. And quite frankly, it's the wrong approach anyway to just sort of have an innovation department. What you need is an innovation factory, right? You need a you need an innovation organization, an innovation culture. You, know, you need a leadership team that that learns how to spell it. And more to the point, learn how to walk and talk it and, and not just have this short term, top down authoritarian type of type of approach. In my research activity is something like between 50 and 60 percent. My teaching activity is around 40 percent. And my um, academic uh, contribution and, uh, uh, is, uh, I mean, to the school and administration and so on, it's probably also 40%. So you will tell me, but this is 140. I enjoy teaching a lot, but I also enjoy researching a lot. And I think that research requires a little bit more time to really kind of 
settle down and breed a lot and then start working on right now I think this is a general universal truth that you just need to write regardless of how much time you have spent on reading and preparing uh, yeah I wouldn't mind a little bit more time <laughs> on research I try to block out as much administration as possible by dedicating time for the teaching and the research but obviously it suffers at the moment more and more um, with more and more committees and more and more uh, other commitments alongside the idea of administration. Um, I would say that now for the research, um, particularly <laughs> at the moment, it's been really down to like um, 20%. I try to spend more than half of my time. I would say about 25% of my time I can devote specifically to research and creative activity? I think it's somewhat situational um, and it very much depends on the individual faculty. I think some people do the kind of research where a certain amount of dedicated time every week is works for them. There are people who write, for example, I don't write novels and things, but I know there are people who say the only way they can be productive is they get up, they start writing at a certain time and they write this much time every day. And that works for them. And there's other people I know who, when they get in to the writing mode, that's all they do. And then when they go dry, they don't write for a while. I, I suspect both of those patterns work for different people. Probably some people can't do one, but can do the other. I think that I'm, I'm sure that research is like that for some people. Yeah, 75%. Uh, would be teaching. So, for example, if you have to dedicate one third of your time in grant research applications, I don't think it's good. I think this is very bad. That every month I'm here, or every month this institution seems to increase workload on areas of administration which in the total decreases the quality of everything else. I don't see that one rule works. I think that some people are probably better off having a, a certain percentage of their time more or less constant because that's the way they work better. And other people, I think, go on binges. And, uh, and some people probably alternate back and forth depending on the mode you're working in. I find I, I, I need to spend a lot of time when I'm writing. I can't, an hour or even two is useless. I don't get into a state of flow. But at some point after a couple days of that, I need to take a break. Deadlines help, deadlines are great. There are some strange invention that helps you to, or helps me or has been in the past helping to keep track on things or uh, have so-called last push of things or actually be able to maybe in a healthy or unhealthy way separate all other issues and focus on one thing. When I think of research, I tend to not think of deadlines. You need to be very creative if you need to put together all that research in a very short period of time or if you need to create something very quickly because simply there is not enough time to do it that thoroughly, which sounds really negative. Sometimes I will have new ideas when the deadline is approaching, but so yes and no. I try very hard not to be influenced by that, but I definitely do feel the pressure. Particularly if I want to go in a completely new direction or follow something that may not work very well, um, there's definitely a pressure there, but I can't say that it definitely does make me less creative. Um, we have conference deadlines, and I know, for example, my colleagues in computer graphics in our lab, boy, the main SIGGRAPH deadline, which is roughly January 15th, I think, every year, that's the biggest thing in their calendar. And starting around December 10th, we have a freeze in the lab of changing anything on the operating systems on the computers, because everything has to work until... January 15th. Okay, so that's a kind of deadline. 
But, and I do think that for some people, it's a little counterproductive because the idea that all of your good ideas will come about six months before January 15th so that you can, you've recovered, you know, you, in fact, you, you've come back from SIGGRAPH, you've got lots of inspiration, you've presented your previous work, you've had, and you've started teaching in the fall. And then now from there till January is this sprint. The idea that everybody in computer graphics in the whole world will be on that schedule just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Sometimes under pressure you come up with those ideas and then again, what is innovation, what is creativity? Uh, it really, like it might be that if you create something at a specific time, the audience, which are the other scholars, pick it up better than 10 years ago or 10 years after. I believe I'm less creative when I'm uh, required to complete my research with a deadline. Certainly all researchers I know set their own deadlines and try to stick them. I mean, that's why we set them. You know, it's, it's part of managing your research. So it's not that I don't have deadlines at all, but the major research grants, like the discovery grant, it's every five years you come up for renewal, but you sort of seamlessly, you know, it's like a, a bump in the highway or an interchange, you seamlessly go through it and you're on to the next grant. And if you're lucky, you've got a little more money than you had before. The, the research is not produced with the deadlines. The research is something happens many um, all over your day. And um, that takes shape at the last minute uh, according to the deadline. So uh, this is not the research you're doing when you, you're just trying to complete your work uh, for the, uh, respecting the deadline. It's more the formulation of the outcomes or the formulation of your research. So this can be done in a pretty short time. Um, and deadlines are just, uh, are just constraints uh, to, uh, uh, to give the final shape to your outcomes. You know, a mature researcher should have the ability to say, this isn't ready and I'm going to wait. Or, no, this is almost ready and we're going to push on and get it ready in time. And yeah, that's a deadline. But we do have, we often have a choice. When we're trying to be innovative, I think that's time well spent. Um, and even when we, you know, when we try and we fail, um, that's still time well spent if we learn from our mistakes. And if, um, if we're just, um, you know, doing other mundane uh, tasks, uh, I, I, one of my favorites in academia uh, was the term administrivia. I felt that as an academic, I, I was, uh, and the reason I left is I, I found I was spending way too much time on what I considered administrivia. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, I've lost my patience somewhere over the years. And if I find myself sitting in a meeting with an agenda, uh, I look at the agenda and I look at the, you know, the fact that I'm required to be there at this meeting with the vice chancellor or whoever it happened to be who called the meeting. And I can't make sense of the agenda or see how I could possibly derive any benefit from sitting through it or how I could contribute to it, then I tend to get up and walk out. You know, in the premises of uh, creativity uh, theory, and, uh, in the, let's say, 50s, 60s, uh, people were uh, always explaining that you become creative because you have constraints. And so the constraints of time can be a good thing. And I believe in that. But I believe in many other kind of constraints. For example, I'm very creative when I sleep. You, you, you hear this advice actually about writing and other, and, and other things that you should put things away and, and forget about them for a while and then come back. And you'll actually see that it's better than you thought, but you'll also see some things that could be improved that if you just keep pounding away at it, you don't. So, and this comes back to the nature of creativity. And I, and I know... There are different kinds of different people's creativity comes in different ways. More time will be will allow to reflect and to revisit an item uh, uh, 
and to question it towards its innovative value and to refine it. If you can have, you know, more time and then you could afford, like, um, say, more failures. And it's important to have this kind of like unsuccessful result because you know that you can have another, you know, uh, solution. Because there are those research articles that are based upon your existing work or building a game that you, you already you have thought through what it will be and you just need the team with, with whom you will implement that. But at the same time there is a more overarching, like more philosophical layer that probably takes more time and every now and then it's good to just sit down and think of nothing and then come up with something. I feel like I'm under pressure to produce a certain amount of product per year. And uh, if I don't have that much time to spend, I need to follow a course where I'm pretty sure I can get something done uh, and something that's disseminatable in the time I have. Uh, if I have more time, like on sabbatical, then I can follow avenues that uh, may, are highly likely to have a dead end. Uh, I have more time to experiment with things. Uh, so definitely the time is, is a factor in terms of creativity. I always considered that um, there is part of the process uh, which is not uh, produced in a uh, usual uh, sitting to the desk situation. I feel that uh, entrepreneurship and its result, innovation, is actually a, f a fundamental part of the human spirit. Uh, I feel that, that uh, for human beings to um, achieve fulfillment you know, of their, in a sense, their purpose for existing, I think it's, uh, it's all about finding what their path is to improve the world or some little piece of it. And um, so for me, quality time is time that we spend in that pursuit. And it might not, we might not be enjoying it. You know, sometimes the journey might be painful or, or it, um, uh, you know, it's not, it's not about having fun necessarily, but it is about uh, striving to improve ourselves, our environment, the world around us, our relationships, you know, other people. And for me, that's quality time. And low quality time is, lower quality time is probably everything else. You know, it used to be if you were of a certain class, you had a house that had purpose-built rooms. Now, there was the dining room, and the living room was really separate, and there was a parlor. Well, you know, who has that now? So that really affects the way you work. If we also count the psychological factors, like if you feel happy with the uh, situation and environment, of course, that counts. And, and I mean, basically, I think that physicality is... Um, and that um, is to provide more like a stress-free situation. So that means you can concentrate working. The ideal space for me to create is that I can uh, be there. I lived in the space uh, 24 hours a day. And then whenever I came up with an idea and then I can just grab the tools and then try because I uh, I do a lot of experiment uh, to create new things, but the idea won't just uh, uh, appear when I just sit down and then you know have a uh, at a scheduled time and then I create. It's not like this. The idea comes and you know at any time. Some uh, are very close to what people call uh, call feng shui. Uh, means, for example, I don't want to have doors behind me. I don't want to have people moving behind me. I don't have, you, you know, here, if you see the, the PhD students, they have always people moving behind them. It creates some, an unconscious stress that can be, it should be avoided. Um, I, like to see, I like to see the door where people can come, uh, and my door is often open. So it's more about you know, the possibility to come and talk. And uh, I, have a, I, have a, 
I'm lucky. I have a nice view with nice windows. Help me to dream. The lab that I put together here on government grants is the perfect place for me to do research and creative activity. Uh, I'm very happy, very grateful to be in Hong Kong that has the resources that I could put something like this together. So yeah, I have designed this place to be exactly what, uh, exactly what I would want to, to do to follow my own creative interests. When I'm doing research on VR, virtual reality, um, I probably don't want any windows. I want really good control over lighting. Uh, I want a fairly large space because depending what era this is in and what we're doing, uh, we may have trackers and things that are mounted in the ceilings or, well, magnetic trackers like a Polhemus, or we may be using uh, cameras, et cetera. And so we want a pretty big, pretty empty space that we can put anything we want in and move it around. And we need that space for a significant amount of time days, weeks, months, because we're setting up an experiment. My ideal space, yeah, it's, it's literally a space with, a, with the ability to overlook my work and reflect on previous work with the ability to create new work. And for that, it needs a little bit of space. It doesn't need to be too silent. I can work with headphones. I don't have a particular difficulty with that. Um, it doesn't need to be particular warm or cold. I, I worked in, in spaces that were brick, non-insulated brick buildings, so it was terribly cold in the winter in the UK. So we really build games that only need the software and always stay in their computer. Only reason to need space is for different devices for testing. So you would need, need to test the, either in the office by yourself or in a user setting. The physical space is size might matter, but somehow I guess it also depends on what kind of um, physical work um, you need to do. Um, of course, like if you have more spacious room and that gives you more possibility to house, you know, um, more facilities. It does not need to be very big. Uh, but since I also work with, uh, you know, large machines like robotic arms, so uh, so not super small, uh, a space that is around uh, 500 to 2,000 uh, square feet would be perfect. Yeah. But I just think it's part of the MBAs, MBAs taking over uh, running universities as a business where they look at the utilization rate of the rooms. And if they don't have a high enough utilization rate, they're not cost effective. And so that that's always the enemy, that kind of thinking of making the decisions that support creativity and innovation, because the very definition of creativity and innovation, to me, the heart and soul of it is involving putting things together in a way that isn't obvious how to do it and other people haven't done it. And so that means that you need the pieces there. So if there aren't any pieces except standard pieces, you're kind of only going to get standard things. I design my space very often. You know, I design my house, I design my space. And I design the point where I should be in the space in order to be able to, to be in a better position to do what I want to do. Uh, and so, for example, in my, in my studio in Paris, uh, I created different office positions and there is one which is in a mezzanine with a nice overview, with a very nice view on the patio with plenty of plants. This is not where I want to be. I don't want to dominate the space. I have been working with teams around me. And so I like a, another kind of corner where I can be quiet, but I can also see what's going on. I can talk with people. So for me, uh, it's more uh, how you define the network of uh, potential dialogue in the space that makes sense and uh, is important. You know, I think the environment is important. And I, and, um, and I, you know, when you see, I've been in environments and seen uh, environments where it's row after row after row of desks and cubicles. And you know, I remember um, uh, the first time I visited Japan, um, you know, seeing the engineering department at Nippon Telephone and Telegraph, one of our biggest customer at the time. And it was, 
yeah, just row after row after row of desks. But you know, it wasn't the right physical environment, but even more important, the the leadership environment just absolutely stifled any any chance for creativity. I would say the biggest difference there is uh, related to interpersonal relationships, because if you're actually working with other people, the environment has to support collaborative and teamwork. Uh, whereas if you're just working on your own, it, the environment should be very different. There's this book called Peopleware, which is about software development, sort of a follow on to the mythical man month. And one of the things he talks about is that the environment for a programming team, physical environment is very important, makes a difference whether you're in a bullpen, you're in separate offices. If you are in separate offices, you wanna be co-located so you can go to you know, one of your colleagues' offices, that there's some space, some meeting space outside that for informal ad hoc meetings. And he specifically says you want some plants. And as I mentioned, uh, uh, Bill Buxton, I remember in the mid 80s, him giving a talk where he said every computer graphics lab has to have plants in it. And that was in part because you usually don't have natural lighting because you color is a big deal. So you make that choice, but then you have to do something to compensate for it. Now I'm provided with a lab space, but the space does not have window. Uh, uh, people would think a lab would not need to have a window, but I think that's quite crucial. Yeah, I would like to have a lab with windows. Uh, this is also one of the reasons that I don't want to move my office to it. I, I would rather to stay in my tiny office with window, with a tiny window, but at least there is a window. Well, I do have plants and I do have a large window in my office. Um, I felt in the beginning when I moved to that new office, it's in a very nice Zaha Hadid building, uh, I tended to open and close the curtains or the blinds and see how it works. But right now I got so used to it that I don't even notice if they are open or closed. I think it does matter though that I know there is a window. I can have a look outside if I want to. Um, I never use a sofa or a comfortable chair for working, not even for reading. So I tend to be a person who likes to sit in front of a preferably very large desk where there's space to spread things around. Um, now, it gets a little bit tricky because I could say that I have worked in spaces that are physically quite depressing because they lack, for instance, daylight. Um, but at the same time, I have to acknowledge that daylight, while I know that it affects my mood and my, my emotions, is not necessarily affecting my ability and my interest to work. So, in fact, working in a room without daylight uh, obviously lets you forget time. And as a matter of fact, short term, you get very focused uh, and is actually quite appreciative. But long term, you, you suffer from, from, from just the idea of withdrawal syndrome of let's say, of, of, of natural daylight, of understanding times, when you work or how you work. To me, the ideal environment is, uh, is uh, changeable. Um, so in other words, um, I think people should get up off their butts and uh, go for walks on the beach. Um, and I think, uh, I think people should uh, you know, take, take a, a team that's struggling with a problem and, and go and have a picnic in a, in a nice uh, forest somewhere. I guess everybody has that ideal that if only I had the time and the place, I would like to be here and here, and then I would able to create something amazing within a very short period of time even. But the reality is that we are, we have those offices and then how you form that office to fit your research is the actual question. Um, I tend to be a person who often likes to have a tidy environment, for instance, or does it want to have a lot of interruptions coming from outside? I don't think there is an ideal environment that I would want to just be in and stay in and attempt to, to work in. Um, I'm a big believer in getting up and walking around and talking to people. I think um, you know, Google's environment where they um, encourage people to play and they encourage people to, uh, to leave their office and, and you know, for one day a week not do their job. Um, I think that's the right kind of environment. In fact, get out, get out of the, you know, we, we need to get out of the uh, uh, box 
right? Think outside the box of our own head, but also outside the box of our own organization and outside the four walls that we that we work in. If you're in the kitchen, you're more likely to remember where which drawer you have a utensil in. Whereas if I asked you abstractly in some other part of the house, where would I find this cooking utensil? Well, obviously in the kitchen, but which drawer is it in? Well, that's a much harder thing to remember, I think. And so I think that's another reason for having different spaces for research that are going to be dedicated to certain kinds of tasks, because that gets you, I think this part I'm speculating, but I think it gets you into a state of flow more quickly because it quickly focuses you in on the task you're doing and things related to it because of these implicit memory and just familiarity. And it kind of clears your mind in some sense of the other things in your life because, oh, now I'm in physics or now I'm in chemistry or now I'm in the place where I do digital music and I create music. There is a, a relationship towards what you are working, the space you're working in, and the objects and items and artifacts, almost similar to the, the concept of a Wunderkammer or so, you, have, you surround yourself with, with what you are actually working, researching on. So there's a feedback between the environment and the objects in the environment, and your inspiration, your creativity, maybe as well leading to innovation. So if you have no space to surround yourself, particularly when you're working on physical and digital objects with physical objects around you, then it gets very tricky. I actually went out to my kids' school at the time and took photographs in the kindergarten and lower levels all the way up to high school of what was on the walls in the classroom. And then and we did a panorama. And then we did the same thing for a university lecture hall. And it's no comparison. The lower the level was, kindergarten, every wall that isn't a window is filled with something. Might be a blackboard, might be a bulletin board, it's photos, it's pictures, it's all sorts of things that are up there. And these are all visual aids, that, and it's the knowledge embedded in the environment. And then you look at a university and there's no knowledge embedded in the environment. There's a blackboard or a whiteboard and there's a screen or now two screens and maybe some more, but there's nothing on them. It all has to be brought there. And so I think we have yet to get back to where we used to be, which is if you have enough screens and you've got the means to deliver them, you could actually have in the classroom the same rich media experience that we grew up with. And in fact, Decades before us grew up, even the small one-room schoolhouse still had. The whole front was a blackboard, and there was other stuff, too. The most important thing when you're deciding where you're going to go work as an academic is who your colleagues are. Yeah, the environment is vitally important, but a key part of the environment is the people in it and how they behave and their mindset and how they work together and how they communicate or don't communicate effectively with each other, uh, how they waste their time not uh, confronting each other or are they, how they fail to really uh, look outside the organization to understand um, what they're seeing in the wider world and, and the implications for how they're working. I would say that by and large, I have tried to always be in a situation where my colleagues were my friends. I would say predominantly working colleagues. Um, there's maybe one I would consider a friend. Some of my colleagues are my friends. Uh, even though we don't hang out, uh, but some of my colleagues are just co-workers. It depends on the colleague. Some of them I consider my friends, some of them they are just working colleagues. Usually I consider um, professional friendship. Yeah. And of course, I mean, at certain points, um, you would also have this professional friends, um, um, you know, to share more, um, you know, um, uh, inner circles or inner social circles. I've often said that it's not essential that we like each other for us to be able to work together effectively and, and indeed for us to be able to innovate together. Uh, I don't think we need to like each other. I think that, that sometimes people can disagree 
almost violently about about certain things and and it's actually good if we can really engage in that kind of conflict uh where wherein people might not actually in a sense like each other well i'd say it's pretty pretty trite but it's respectful so the three of us the, the three main faculty members that really i identify with as being we started the lab and we carried it all the way through we were joined by others but even when we we're joined by others we had a mutual respect for each other and our abilities and our opinions and our quirks and we also realized that it was like a like a, a good marriage you, know, you never agree on everything and why would you want to marry someone who does exactly what you do what would be the fun in that you want someone who has different interests, different capabilities, you know, so that you can share the burdens and also share the excitement and the joy. And so I would say that's what you're looking for in a set of colleagues. You're not looking for someone who even fully understands what you do, because if they do, one of you is redundant. If one would given the chance to openly discuss research projects, ups and downs, pros and cons, uh, progress of it in groups of four to five to six, on a weekly basis, as part of the culture of the place, that would be a perfect interpersonal relationship, uh, facilitating and catalyzing innovation in work. I do part of my research by describing the research to other people. So uh, for me, it's part of the process to uh, talk about what I'm doing. And uh, it helps me a lot to uh, improve it because I have to find the words. But I think, I think that encouraging that kind of friendly environment where, where people feel like they can and should go and talk to people. And again, I think that's, that's partly what Google is accomplishing and other organizations that are adopting this model of saying, don't just sit in your cubicle and don't just continue meeting and talking with the people you're officially in the same department as. Get out and go out and talk to other people, you know, even, even outside the organization. More often it happens that if one has an encounter with a colleague and has a short conversation that something like that comes up and that, that then I would ask a colleague of mine, uh, what is, what's your opinion about this part, what I'm just working on? I realized when I was at Water that I could not possibly accomplish what I did without my colleagues. And it was not just that they were supportive, it is that we were sort of a match set. And one of my colleagues, I remember, used to, you know, the phrase principal investigator. So he called me the principal instigator because I was always the one who said, hey, there's this new grant program. Let's apply for it. And I was like, oh, no, not again. Um, and I think an honest assessment of, of my 13 years at Waterloo is of the three of us who were the primary people in the group the whole time, because we were joined by some others later. But I would say of the three of us, I was probably the least successful slash productive in terms of my research output having you know impact you know measure it journal articles top conference papers you know impact and whatever but the lab had a lot and i think that my other colleagues had more impact but i don't think they would have had that impact without me because they wouldn't have the environment in which to do it maybe this is a problem i actually i don't talk very often, like um, my research work with others. Yeah, it happens. And usually, you know, when I got questions from others, and then I would really share what I have done. But, um, um, but of course, like that would also depends on the opportunities. If that was instigated, you know, by someone. And in my case, um, that that didn't happen very often, unfortunately. Yeah. There is no incentive or no stimulation. Or, well, incentive is too much. No stimulation, no infrastructure to share any form of research. There is once a month a so-called brown bag talk, which is not which is not bad to be honest. It's quite interesting to see what people are working on, but it's a very um, deserted institutionalized. Um, infrastructure. Other than that, it is more of the nature that the door is closed, people are working in their own little rooms and doing whatever they do. Those close colleagues that I work with, 
are supportive. Of course, there are exceptions and some people who have very different background or very different academic interests or beliefs and values, uh, but generally, yeah, supportive. I would say supportive because I've, I've known contexts, university contexts, where people were obviously not supportive because they consider you as a competitor. So as soon as you're not in this mood and people are really interested by what they do, then the quality of uh, dialogue is better uh, because uh, they want to understand and you want to understand them. Part of that in my case is that uh, I do work that's quite different from anybody else in the department being in a music department only. Uh, so I'm really the only person in the department right now that really focuses on creative media. Uh, so I don't have that much in common with people doing other work. So I would say rarely, uh, but I certainly do. People, I have colleagues asking me to listen to some of their pieces uh, and likewise uh, I have them listen to my pieces, see what their reaction is. I have regular meetings actually with my with some of my colleagues, and we uh, we don't just sit down and uh, talk about our, our idea, but we have a very formal, uh, similar, and ask our student or research assistant to present something, and then out of that we might discuss uh, new possibilities. Well, I would say, like, if there could be more social space that um, you could share with others, um, for example, like, um, kind of like comfy situations that you could just chat. And as a, that's probably related to what I answered to before. And I didn't talk very often about my research to others because Usually that happens, you know, in some kind of informal situation first, like um, when we somehow come up with kind of like a uh, common topic and then it would, uh, you know, touch like something I have done. I kind of like visitors a lot, like the kind of environment where people come and go, but at the same time it can be quite, um, it it can interfere with the actual research because you get too many input, too much ideas from outside all the time. So I think there needs to be a balance in that respect. What would be perfect is to be in a much larger department or school uh, in which I had uh, diverse colleagues working in different areas, but there was room to hire more people that work in areas similar to mine. Um, that way there'd be more people that we could, uh, I could take a look at their work, they would see what my work is going, we could uh, trade software, uh, max MSP patches, that would be ideal for me. Uh, the ideal situation would be uh, I have the opportunity to meet people, especially smart people, uh, in my working environment. Uh, and actually now I think uh, I meet um, many, you know, good students and my colleagues and some uh, guests from the outside. So that would be uh, very helpful for my research. If one has actually a, a, a critical feedback, particularly because the environment I work in here is of incredible diversity. So there's an incredible diversity and range of backgrounds. So mine is architecture. My colleague is an art historian. Uh, the next one is a computer scientist. So to, uh, to be able to throw an idea at uh, such a interdisciplinary panel, you could almost say, as a conversation, uh, of course allows innovation to happen in different fields rather than just in your own field, if so at all. Uh, when we genuinely, when you genuinely like other people, and it, 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 maybe that it's not friendship that's that's critical. I think what's more critical, perhaps, is uh, trust and respect and appreciation. So, I might not like someone, but if I, but if I am able to fundamentally trust them, 
And also, if I respect them, the fact that they might be very, very different from me, um, they might not be the sort of person I'd necessarily want to go and have a beer after work with. But if we trust each other and we can work together and we can communicate and we're willing to challenge each other um, and, and do so with respect, I'll use the pyramid as, as an example. I, I think that um, when we have these pyramid structures where the leader's at the top and it's all sort of top-down application of power and control, um, then I think we've got a very ineffectual structure for innovation. It's management by fear. It's top-down control. It's top-down decision-making, uh, bottom-up requests, um, and so on. Um, but it's ineffectual. And what I often say leaders need to do is flip the paradigm, flip the pyramid on its head and recognize that uh, they, as the leader, are shouldering responsibility for the whole organization. So they're the servant of everyone. Okay? And what they need to do, of course, is empower other leaders at every level in the organization to lead and to be able to say yes to customers. Yes, I can solve your problem. And especially right up here, the coal face, dealing with the customer and solving the customer's problems. You don't want to have a problem up here have to get escalated or whatever, all the way down there, right? Uh, you want it to be solved quickly. And so you want to empower people here to solve the problem. And of course, what happens is if you flip the paradigm, then, then and you create this empowerment, the structure naturally flattens out as well. And, and so you end up with uh, much less need to escalate. And you actually end up with a wider uh, call face for value delivery as well. So I know it's a bit of a metaphor, but I, I do think that flipping the paradigm is one fundamental point that all leaders should, should think about. They should think of creating a servant leadership culture where they are the servant of everyone and every other leader. Uh, they the more important their position, the more they need to be humble and the more they need to uh, see themselves as servants rather than people to be feared or people to be, uh, uh, you know, bowed down to. I suffered a lot the first year uh, because the administrative bureaucratic thing uh, took, let's say, two thirds of my time. It was difficult for me even to understand what it was about. And what was the purpose? Why so many forms? Why so many documents? Why so many committees? Why so many people to ask people to ask people to ask people to sign the paper at the end of uh, 80 pages you have to read for tomorrow? And it was this all the time. As the paperwork and paperwork and all the bureaucracy, how you need to report everywhere and all the time and every single purchase needs so many uh, mechanisms of checking that it's it's going properly but at the same time we are using taxpayers money so I take that but I guess it's the paperwork that is the most demanding part the most diminishing institution for my research in uh, activity is the research office uh, as well as the financial office because a continuous growing administration that is uh, that is invading research work um, and making it incredibly inflexible and incredibly difficult to even react to results of the research, saying a three-year research project will obviously yield results in year one, which obviously needs to lead to a reflection on resources that were agreed upon in the research, that, that, uh, that idea possible would spark uh, a two-month-long uh, administrative paperwork on shifting uh, finances within a grant. So that, that, that's just a biggest inhibitor because it means that active time that is in the research will now be shifted to discussing the possibility and the administrative necessi necessities to react to the own research. So it's a, it's a perpetuum problem there. Certainly uh, fulfilling universities' obligations for filling out paperwork, um, for showing evidence of this in teaching practice uh, those definitely take away from time. 
and also I don't have as much support as I would ideally like uh, for the technological aspects. So I work in a fairly complex situation and a lab. So if something breaks down, I rarely have somebody that I can go to to ask to fix it. So that takes up a large part of the time that I would otherwise be devoting to specifically to creativity, spending more time having to troubleshoot problems. And this is, uh, for me, this is a, a slight misunderstanding at the beginning that the school could be considered as a lab activity, but it's not. So we have plenty of uh, high-level researchers which are, are totally isolated and they are not considered as being part of a, a research group, like uh, would be the MIT or any big lab. So in terms of research recognition, it's not good as well. So it's a negative impact in terms of uh, a daily practice. It's a negative impact in terms of uh, in international recognition. Yeah, the purchasing uh, procedure is one of the example. Yeah, we uh, cannot because uh, when we have idea, we want to purchase different things and then put together our system to uh, prove it, it works or not. But uh, because of the purchase system, we usually would have to spend like two or three months to buy one particular thing. Uh, so the amount of time that we, uh, that we need to, you know, really from having the idea to realize the system would usually spend six or even one year. So that will be, you know, very bad. So for me, the problem is more finding ways to have more consistent teams uh, that help us uh, to go faster and deeper in the research. And we have the feeling that maybe we need to get more money. But as it is usually slices of money, we get slices of time and slices of people, so we don't create a long-term team. Like sometimes you have the momentum that you have a great idea and you know that there's an audience out there right now and it's very topical, you just need to do it now. But then the research funding would come one and a half years after. So it's much better to have a smaller amount next month than bigger one in one and a half years. There's a number of, of situations in which I would have hoped that given by the standards of the uh, institution, that my track record throughout research and teaching would have helped to help me in my development. So if we talk about the possibility of helping facilitate the, the, the development of an employee, then that is, um, did not happen in the past. We have a system that will carefully and uh, precisely grade our research output and then the, the formula will result in a performance index that will directly uh, affect our salary. Of course, we have this uh, PBPR uh, 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 thing that's supposed to, um, uh, to uh, assess our research activity and our global activity in the university. Um, I slightly disagree in some aspects. Uh, which are counterproductive for me. Um, of course, it's important to, to um, say what you're doing and, um, and the institution has to know what you're doing. But the way this is assessed is always a problem in the art field uh, because it doesn't work exactly like the other uh, disciplines. So yes, there are people who are naturally much more talented, much smarter, much more creative, and they will do well. Uh, we should probably support them because they will be our superstars. But we have a lot of other people who run, you know, their second stringers. Most teams have to have a good, strong bench. I don't think anybody evaluates the content of my research. I mean, unless I have misunderstood this entire system, I don't think anybody is evaluating my research outcome other than the amount of paper I write, which are peer-reviewed then by external organizations. 
Because we are a very uh, inter interdisciplinary uh, academic unit. Everyone does different things. Uh, so it is very hard for our academic unit to have a very fair um, uh, you know, method to evaluate everybody's uh, research. You know, I'm from a visual arts background, so not all the visual arts institutions could be somehow, um, you know, be equivalent to this academia. But in the visual arts practice, they are very important institutions. Somehow they were not recognized. But it would be better if uh, there would be more uh, qualitative understanding of what and what everyone is doing. They do not have qualitative assessments or they don't trust their own internal qualitative assessments at all. So if they're assessing my work, they are doing it on the basis of outside sources. So has this been accepted to a tier one journal? Uh, if I'm promotion to tenure, how do people outside of the universities view your work? Um, there aren't people in the university in my department that would be allowed to say, oh, he's doing excellent work. That needs to be proven externally. I would like it to be very transparent, that I would know what is, what is valued, what is not, what is the vision behind all this, where are we going, and that if this year these are the top journals that you should publish on, we might trust that it's the same in five years. But I would comment that the current uh, system is too mechanical. And even if we consider, for example, the exhibition of a new work in a new context, a very valuable uh, context, um, as a publication, we know that for most of the faculty in, in the university, this is not, this is not uh, and the same things that publishing in a, in a major journal or something like that. I definitely feel that uh, there's an urgency uh, for me to do traditional research. And I definitely feel that if I did only creative activity, that may or may not be held in as high a regard. The other point is, uh, I think there are, uh, there are fake targets, uh, like for example counting if you get or not a grant when you don't need a grant. When I was hired, or before I was hired, I would think uh, I, would, I would focus on what I used to uh, do, which is to make artwork every day. Um, however, after uh, I know that I have to be evaluated uh, within six year times uh, on my research output and also the, uh, the kind of grants that I obtain, then I change my plan. In terms of my creative activity, I've been here long enough that I've seen a change. Uh, 20 years ago, they would look very skeptically at uh, um, creative research, at turning out music, turning out videos as research. Uh, and there were different views of that. Some people said to me, frankly, for promotion and tenure, composers should compose. And then I ran into a dean who said, well, you've been here four years, you haven't published a single article. So the expectations differ. And I have seen expectations change over the time I've been here, um, but there's still quite a few people that would have difficulty thinking that a composition, a performance, would be at the same level as a um, publication in a tier one journal, perhaps. We used to have something like the equivalent of four A plus or five A plus every year, which was not possible in many other disciplines. Of course, what happened after, they decided to under-evaluate what we do. And then suddenly, 
uh, when we, uh, we do a kind of amazing work in terms of impact and in terms of research quality, it's uh, underestimated for a reason which is, yeah, it's more difficult for other disciplines to reach this level. So instead of uh, reconsidering the global grid with new uh, criteria, uh, they just changed, they just added a filter to, um, uh, on, your, uh, on our assessment. And then suddenly it doesn't reflect anything because if we use the university grid, we would all of us be much above the maximum all the time. Possibly due to the environment of Hong Kong, uh, they mu feel much more secure with assessments from outside of Hong Kong. That yes, uh, I'm from outside of Hong Kong and I will verify that this faculty for you is doing work at an international level and a level similar to what we're doing in this overseas institution. Whereas they would be very reluctant to trust somebody in Hong Kong saying, yes, his work is up to some level. Yeah, so by and large, except for tenure and promotion, through my entire career as an academic, as far as I know, all of the evaluation and assessment and salary was done within my department. The department has a salary pool and merit and things like that. So, you know, there were rules and, you know, the, the, you know good, bad, and different, but they was largely within the department. So, um, and at UBC, I came in as a tenured full professor. So I didn't have, uh, yeah, I, I never went through anything other than salary. I think it's compounded by the fact that virtually all our upper administrations are in, from the sciences. So they don't have much of a background in which to assess or give credit to a poet or a painter. That's far outside their expectations, far outside their field, and they would feel much more comfortable if somebody outside the university would say, yes, this work is equivalent to a paper published in a tier one journal. I don't think I can really um, put it in one sentence, but like in, in a way, I always say that like, um, you know, that sort of like award punishment system, um, um, I don't really see how it can really make you creative. But on the other hand, as we said that like, um, this kind of incentive could um, encourage you to work more. And somehow like if you work more, that personally, I find that um, that somehow like it would raise the chance you do some more interesting work interesting in a way than creative work. As a matter of fact, there are small subtle ways of reward or punishment which have to do with space and space allocation. Better research, better result equals better office. Not research, not grant equals no better office. So as encouragement, I would say they're like award words, but not punishment. Oh, they make me absolutely zero more or less creative. They make me maybe a little bit less if I let myself be stressed by them, if we can say that stress is an inhibitor of creativity, which I'm not entirely sure that that's the case. Um, but they're definitely not increasing creativity by, by an iota or anything, zero. And also because of the pressure from my uh, substantiation of my contract, uh, I have to apply for a lot of funding whenever there's an opportunity. Uh, sometimes I would just look at the requirement of the funding opportunity and then I would uh, you know, come up with an idea that may not be aligning perfectly with my research interests or what I'm currently working on just to get that you know, funding. I think I'm self-limiting myself because I see that that's where the opportunities are right now and, and the, within the limited time then I would rather go that way because the exploration is always maybe a little bit too risky at this point of my career.
Sometimes I find in the institution not all kind of creative works or innovation work uh, um, can be recognized. So, um, so in this case, um, you have to adjust your work or your results such that they could say it's creative. The keywords that you need to put into your journal publications, the, the kind of funding that you go after, is defined by your department. So after I decided to do more engineering research, and I found that I actually quite enjoy uh, making systems uh, from the engineering perspective, uh, because I found creativity and innovation in it, and I found the sense of uh, uh, achievement in it. So, so my plan is after the substantiation, I will also uh, spend time on what I'm doing right now, which is uh, engineering research and um, building systems. But I'll, I will also plan to spend substanti substantial time on uh, making media art. That was what I wanted to do uh, five years ago. <laughs> Every year I get a GRF grant, but you know, I'm doing mathematics. What can I do with the grant? I don't need that. But if I don't get it, I'm under considered. Um, and uh, and uh, this can be a big handicap to renew my contract. Stick to those old things you have been working on and not to try to do something new and something more uh, experimental. At the same time, it might be that those traditionally highly valued journals are not the ones who take that experimental research. There are huge rewards for bringing in outside grants. If you're bringing in money from the UGC or outside, uh, they do, they, they really bend over backwards uh, to try and top that up with additional funding, additional space, different types of resources. So outside funding is uh, a huge reward system for us. Of course, punishment, yeah, if, you're in, if you don't have, sorry, in terms of punishments, uh, if you're not able to have a successful external grant, say a GRF, the chances of you being promoted or of even giving a second contract is not very good. I remember many situations where there was a traditional kind of top-down management through fear approach and they were certainly you know in a way they were succeeding in making me afraid um although i wouldn't show it and and i often said the the fact that and it's true i i was never afraid of being fired and i think that's one of the reasons i succeeded even in that environment i i you know honestly i wasn't really afraid even though it was a climate of fear. So they were trying to intimidate me. They were trying to you know, poke holes in my uh, strategy. They're, they're questioning uh, you know, tiny little bits of my investment strategy and, and you know, poking and prodding and trying to, uh, trying to induce fear. Uh, but in turn, I basically felt that part of my role was to shield my people, my team, from that climate of fear to create a, an environment where we were having fun. The grants are supposed to help research. We had a meeting a few days ago where many faculty around the table and we say we should do a big uh, research conference on this topic because we are working on that. We want to promote it. We want to, uh, we want to exchange with colleagues all over the world. Good. And then we, when we were talking about uh, the dates, we say, oh, September, October, November, and everybody says, oh, no, we can't. This is a GRF grant application time. Imagine, what does it mean? The university is blocked three months a year in, uh, in grant application, even if people don't really know how to use it. This is, this is totally, uh, I, I don't understand that even uh, the institution doesn't feel ridiculous. Putting the pressure on the university, saying if you get, if your 
faculty get more grants, the university will get more money. This is just, as I said before, confusing the means and the end. I, I don't think that punishment is, uh, is an effective strategy or an effective tactic uh, for anything to do with innovation. I think that uh, when you punish people uh, in any way, uh, or even just threaten them uh, with punishment, even you're creating a climate of fear. And to me, uh, fear is, uh, is a phenomenon that makes innovation almost an impossibility. I don't think you can uh, motivate or drive innovation through fear. The university is appreciative of my research as long as it gets published and there's a photo and a smiling person. It's difficult to answer if the institution, because it's like a non-human, you know, institution to have a certain kind of affection or appreciation of my work. But I do feel that like some of the colleagues of this institution um, are interested in what I have been doing. It feels that actually nobody is at all even interested in anybody's research. And as such, there cannot be appreciation or non-appreciation because there's even a lack of knowing what the hell people are doing. Misunderstanding of your contribution. Yeah. That, that misunderstanding would somehow be the result of um, uh, a public that not inclusive um, um, regard of um, the varieties of creative work. The people outside of our uh, academic unit uh, do not know what we are doing. Uh, it is hard for them or for us to defend what uh, are the values of our research. So an environment where they have a recognition, they have an appreciation for creative work, uh, and they're not shy from people who have no research or expectations of research output. So if I were a world-renowned conductor or a world-renowned composer or whatever, that I would find uh, a home that's very safe for me, that I feel appreciated in what I'm doing, and I wouldn't feel pressure to do something else, like publish papers, do traditional research. That would be ideal for me. The just about to leave Dean of Science, who has been here, I guess, for about, but leave meaning step down. He's been Dean, I think, for about 10 years. I know him well. He knows me. I think he respects me. I feel respected by him. Uh, we don't interact a lot all the time. I have told him on more than one occasion that he doesn't respect computer science enough in the sense that he does respect it, but he doesn't do the things that you should do if you want to be seen to respect it. But we do that. I mean, you know, it's a constructive criticism and he takes it that way. And, uh, you know, so I would say I'm on good terms with them. I think that I get listened to. Um, I'd like to see things a little different than they are, but everyone does. I would say an environment like perhaps Yale University School of Music or MIT, where they have a tradition of accepting artists uh, into, into their mix. Um, and also people that have absolutely no academic background. So for my graduate school, the Eastman School of Music, uh, I would be shocked if any of my professors there, teachers, spent any time publishing a paper. Um, they're pianists, they're composers. There's no expectation that they should publish academic work. Uh, likewise, I've noticed uh, Yale S School of Music, they often hire people that are known artists who don't have a doctorate. And I can't see someone hiring, uh, say, a tenure-track position for somebody who doesn't have a doctorate, even though they're a world-renowned poet or author. I don't think that would happen here. I think uh, the university, what they want is not innovative. They want high ranking. No, I, I think appreciation or love is vitally important. Um, you think about it, people have to feel motivated, I think. So partly it's a, it's a question of motivation and people won't feel motivated if they're not appreciated. 
and um, think that um, organizations that think they can just uh, hire people and stick them in a box and uh, or stick them on a treadmill and and expect uh, work to happen uh, are not fundamentally valuing these people as as people as human beings uh, it's Again, I mentioned earlier that I think it's a fundamental aspect of the human spirit to be entrepreneurial. In other words, to want to innovate. Um, I think it's also a fundamental aspect of, of human nature to want to love and be loved, to want to uh, have friendships, to want to be in relationships where you're appreciated, where you're valued. And um, I think any relationship where there isn't that um, foundation, that essential ingredient, I think is doomed to fail. So I think it's vitally important that organizations uh, figure out how to appreciate people and how to motivate them. And again, it isn't about money. It Okay, somewhat about money. We If we have a job... We, uh, we expect to be able to earn uh, some money through our, through our efforts. Um, but just giving people raises or, or bonuses and, or just focusing on the money, um, I think fundamentally fails to appreciate human nature, that people want to feel valued in relationships. They want to feel appreciated. So other forms of, uh, of reward like, um, say, um, opportunities for personal development. You know, hey, you should go to that conference because you'll, you'll learn a lot there and you'll probably meet some interesting people. Or we should give you enough budget so you can actually fly to London and, and uh, have lunch with Dave rather than having a Skype call. Um, so other, other forms of appreciation and they might have costs attached to them, but again, it's not about the money. It's, it's about fundamentally recognizing human nature.